Hello and welcome to memory. Um, this video is going to talk about basically introduction to memory and we're going to look at one of the theories of memory. Okay? Hopefully this video won't go for too long. We'll try and get through this as easily as we can. Alright, so memory. It's really important for learning. You guys will be coming up against this now as you start to study for SACs or start to think about exam revision, how important memory is for learning. Um, because you can't really learn anything without your memory and you can't really remember things if you haven't learnt them. It's a weird kind of mix. But we'll see how we go. But today we're looking more at memory more than anything else and hopefully this will give you an insight into some of the things that you can do to help improve your memory of some of the content in all of your subjects. Okay, um, so we're going to move through this PowerPoint and hopefully that will help you out. Um, I would advise that you take notes as we go along and pause it if you want to. Um, and at the end, I'll give you a couple of activities that I think you should um, maybe try at home. Okay, cool. So, first of all, memory. Memory is another interesting construct where there is no specific part of the brain that is responsible for memory. Um, we have lots of different theories that work on memory um, that believe in the idea that there are lots of different systems that are involved in memory. Um, so we're going to be looking at one of them today and there are some other systems that we're going to be looking at. Cognitive um, psychologists used to like the idea of treating memory like a computer. So you can see from this visual here um, that as we just as we input data into the computer, typing, um, you know, typing up a Word document, that information is processed and transformed, so it's turned into a Word document. We then save it onto the hard drive, and then when we need it again, we can retrieve it. We can get it back. So we can save it on our desktop, or we can save it in our documents, or we can even save it on USB. And if we need it, we can just get it back out. The same kind of idea works with our memory on a very basic level. Uh, cognitive psychologists believe that what happens is we get information from the outside world, um, it comes in, we have to then encode that memory, transform it so it makes sense to us, um, and then if it's handled by the brain and we attend to it, then we can then store it in our brains, in our memory, and at any stage, if, this, if we've stored it correctly and we've encoded it correctly, then we should be able to retrieve it same way that we, if we set up our folders correctly on our computer, we should be able to retrieve the document. Okay, so that's that's kind of the cognitive psychologist's theory um, on memory and how memory works. And um, let's dive right in, I suppose. So you can see here there are three major stages in the memory process. Um, all psychologists tend to pretty much be in agreement with these three stages. So you can see there we have encoding, storage, and retrieval. So in a very simple sense, information comes into us, okay, we have to encode that information, so all the different light and colors and, and shapes and patterns that come into our eyes, we have to encode that to figure out what it is we're looking at, okay. Once we've looked at that, then we can store that in our brains, and then at some stage, if we see that again and we need to remember what that is, then we can um, aid in retrieval, which means we take it out of our brains and we can use it if we need to. Okay. So as you can see there, the encoding is the process of converting information into a usable form so that it can be stored in memory. Storage is the retention of that information over time. Retention is an important word that you will need to know. Um, and then retrieval, another important word, um, which is the process of locating and recovering the stored information from memory so that we are consciously aware of it. Okay, so that we can take it out and we can use it. So, the first theory we're looking at is the Atkinson Schifrin Multi Store Model. It's a fancy name. Um, basically, it looks at, as it sounds, that we store our memories in different places, in multiple places. So we have what we call sensory register or sensory memory. We have short-term 
memory or um, working memory and we have long-term stored memory okay each component has uh, holds on to memory it processes information and it can also transfer information from one of the stores to the other okay we're going to learn a little bit about this in a minute like right now so you can see here you've got the uh, at the top you have the sensory register okay uh, in the middle we have short-term store and at the bottom we have long-term store you'll start to hear these being talked in in terms of memory so sensory memory short-term memory and long-term memory As you can see the diagrams here as the external input which could be anything from something that we're looking at something that we're listening to something that we're touching that comes into our sensory register or our sensory memory now we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about that in a minute but so much information comes into that area okay comes into that memory you think about all the things that are going on I often talk about this in, this in class you know the if you focus on your feet in your socks you can feel them but you, you weren't you couldn't feel that until you paid attention to it all that information is constantly coming in all the sounds in your room on the bus um, all of the things that you're looking at that are outside specifically what you're looking at all of that information is going into the sensory register that information then if you attend to it goes into the short-term memory uh, and then if you really pay attention to information in your short-term memory it can then be transferred into long-term memory once the information's in long-term memory you can then transfer it back to short-term memory okay so let's look at this a little bit more specifically this is an important diagram uh, I suggest that you um, write this down or draw this somewhere so you get a sense of what that is as we go through it will make more sense if you have this written down so in the Atkinson and Schifrin model there are two major types of features there are structural features and there are control processes the structural features are the three main levels okay they are structurally they don't change they stay the same all the time you always have sensory memory you always have short-term memory you always have long-term memory okay they don't vary from one situation to another okay so they are structures like the structures of a building the buildings don't go anywhere the other part of this model are what we call the control processes so the same way as remember when we were talking in um, with attention okay control processes are the same idea you control them you pay attention to them and then you can control how much you pay attention to so these are as it says there processes chosen or used by different individuals in different situations these are things like attention uh, rehearsal and retrieval okay so for example um, if you're sitting in the study center and you're trying to study but you can hear across the way that someone has um, something important to say to one of their friends you might choose to listen to that okay you might choose to listen to what they say and commit that to memory all right whereas usually if you decided that it's not interesting you can still hear that conversation going on but you're not paying attention to it and you're not using it's going into your sensory memory but because you're not paying attention to it it's not going into your short-term memory or into your long-term memory okay so the advantages and disadvantages for the Atkinson and Schifrin multi-store model are here the advantages are it's a nice simple single memory system okay that we can plug a whole bunch of different parts of memory into okay and it gives us um, the difference tells us about the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory which was revolutionary for its time some of the limitations are the is it later research has found that information doesn't simply go from sensory memory to short-term memory to long-term memory um, there are certain things that have to be done to make sure that that information stays in each memory structure before it moves on to the next one 
Recent research has also told us that short-term memory is a lot more complex than Atkinson and Schiffer and first thought, um, and also that long-term memory is also more complex, um, as we now know that um, there are different compartments of long-term memory for different types of information. But as a pioneering model, this is still a pretty well accepted and, and a solid um, basis for most other memory models. So we're going to look now at sensory memory. Okay, um, This is in your textbook definition, which I know you guys love. The entry point of memory where new incoming sensory information is stored for a very brief period of time. Important that we note there, very brief period of time. Okay, because there is so much sensory information coming into your, your sensory register. Think of all the sounds that are in your room now. Try and just, wherever you are watching this video, just stop and try and find five or six different sounds. Okay, hopefully you got a few there. What's important is, is that all of that information is constantly bombarding you. Okay, there is visual touch, um, smell, um, auditory information, all of that is constantly coming into your sensory register and your sensory memory. Now you cannot always pay attention to all of it and you wouldn't want to pay attention to all of it, otherwise the world would be very, very confusing and very, very messy. So, even though we have unlimited storage capacity here, okay, what we need to understand is, is that we need to attend to information for it to go to the next level of short-term memory or what we call working memory for processing. If we don't attend to it, it just drops out pretty much, well, very quickly. So, even though we have heaps of information coming in, if we don't pay attention to it, it drops out of our memory, our sensory memory and it doesn't go to the next level of short-term memory. Recent research tells us that there are separate, what we call separate registers, sensory registers, for sensory memory. So you have sensory memory as the whole, okay, but you have a specific visual sensory register and an auditory register and a touch register. So that your brain basically puts them into different compartments, okay? Um, and any any information that they decide that's not important gets dropped out of memory. Um, so then we have some of our sensory registers here. Iconic memory, so visual memory. So visual sensory memory, it's brief, okay? It retains, it sticks around for about one third of a second. The best way to think of this is if you've ever been outside at night time and you have a torch or sparklers, okay, and if you whiz them around really fast, it kind of leaves a tail, okay? That's because the image is so bright that as it goes past, your visual system holds onto that memory and it stays in the darkness, so the contrast is still there. So... As you move the sparkler around, you can see evidence of your iconic memory. So the little tail that stays behind the sparkler, okay, is, is the little one third of a second that, that's sticking around there. The next one is echoic memory. You guys will know this very, very well. Imagine this idea when you are sitting at the back of the room, you're talking to your friend, not really paying attention to the teacher, and then the teacher says something and they say your name, and you turn around and you go, huh, what? But before they can repeat what they said, you kind of hear again what they said. Like it's like sticks into your brain a little bit later. And you can answer the question or you can tell them what you were talking about, what they were talking about. Does that make sense? So in our auditory sensory memory, uh, it's retained a bit longer than visual memory. Um, so it's retained for about three to four seconds. So we can hear that like an echo. You can see it there, echoic memory is that you can then hear that for a little bit longer. Um, it doesn't say that it always swims around in there, and it, it like sounds really blurry, 
but if you have to, you can kind of attend to that and it will be staying around somewhere in your um, echoic memory or your auditory register. So that's why sometimes that works well. Uh, it's a bit of a weird phenomenon, but hopefully you kind of get what I'm talking about.